We're plus two comedy. We're the people you don't care about for this panel. <laughs> to my left is a acclaimed voice actor, the voice of all those wonderful characters you see behind you, as well as the creator of Sunny Straight Studios. Sunny Straight's here, everybody. I'm also uh, a comic book artist. Uh, I've got a book from Dark Horse that just came out this month. Uh, it's Elf Quest, uh, Stargazer's Hunt, Volume 2. Uh, so check that out. If you guys have any questions about, I've been an actor, a director, a writer, all for Funimation, and I guess now Crunchyroll, and uh, also a comic book artist for since 1988. So if you have any questions that run the gamut of any of those fields, I will answer them now. Yeah, I'll, I'll run out into the crowd in a moment and get, uh, get questions. Uh, Sonny, we, we always play a game whenever we get to interview somebody, and I was wondering if you'd play this game with me. Yes. Uh, on IMDb, there's a section called Known For. It's the four things that an actor is the most known for. Uh-oh. It is based on nothing. <laughs> We've never been able to figure out a pattern. So I wanted to ask you, what are the four things you think you are the most known for, according to IMDb? And I will um, let you know how you do. Probably the voice actor who gets flashed at conventions the most, maybe? That is, that is number one. I thought so. I thought that was true. Uh, the, the, the only voice actor when he comes to New Town, he says, where's the dispensary, maybe? <laughs> no, there's so many more. <laughs> okay. What's on the list? Uh, for, apparently, IMDb thinks you are famous for Krillin, 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 and Krillin. Uh, all but Krillin. <laughs> apparently, that's the only thing that they're giving you credit for, is Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Z Kai. I, is Krillin your favorite? No, oh, I hate him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, Krillin definitely has to be my favorite. I mean, he's... Actually, I say my favorite character is Koro Sensei, but uh, Krillin was, I have a really special place in my heart for him because he was the first anime character I did. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of anime out there. Right. And Funimation was one of the few companies out there dubbing. So I thought, uh, this is a fad, it'll last about two years, and then I'll have to go back to work uh, drawing comic books full time. But it turned out to be a career that lasted that's, that's 24 years now, I think. Uh, so me and Krillin have been around a long time. And thank God he ages too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you were worried that you'd have to go back to your old dream job, that your new dream job would work out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I never gave up my other dream job. I just spent less time on it. Do we get any Twitter questions, or should I run into the crowd? Not yet. It is run into the crowd. Time. All right, I'm going to run into the crowd. If you have a question, raise your hand. Don't go right in front of those speakers. Right, I won't. Why are you going to... All right, I see a hand up in the second row, middle aisle. You good? I'm going to predict what the question is. <laughs> Ooh, I like this plan. How did you get into voice acting? Well, the hand didn't go down, so it doesn't appear that was the question. What's your question, sir? Uh, what was your favorite line as Koro Sensei? Okay, so I'm not a psychic. No. You have to rub it in. Favorite line of Koro Sensei. First you take the planet Earth, round and blue and green, and floating over Tokyo you drop a giant bean. Put another one in Sichuan, China, what a scene. Taking off from Dubai to Hawaii and Mach 20 leaf controls as you fly. Double back across the southern hemisphere once again to old Dubai and then back to Hawaii drawing lines of latitude every 29 degrees along the way. And there you have it! Koro Sensei C Simple. Now you try it. That was my favorite line. It's a long line. I'm, su I'm surprised you can remember all that. That was impressive. I got another yeah. question here for you. What would Curlin say if he ever met Usopp? Uh, yeah, uh, you talk funny. <laughs> and Usopp said, what do you mean I talk funny? You just talk funny, man. I don't, I sound just like you. No, you sound like me with a hitch in your voice. <laughs> oh yeah, that hitch hurts. Yeah, it sounds like it, it sounds painful. Something like that. All right, we have a question in the front row, this side center. All right, I'm coming over. 
I took the longest route. I apologize. Well, you didn't want to go in front of the speakers. Have you ever been surprised by um, the direction the characters arc? Surprised of the, of the direction that the character has gone in? Yeah. Oh. There's something that happened to get here. Yeah. Yeah, I was really surprised um, when Usopp, now spoilers, um, decided to battle Luffy. Uh, I did not see that coming. And then when he became the Sniper King or the Soga King, uh, I didn't see that coming. Um, and then and then he got to sing that song as well. I'm not gonna sing another song. Um, the, the Sniper King song, that was surprising as well. Usopp's a very surprising character. And I'll tell you this also, I thought that he was like just comic relief. And then that episode where he gets the money stolen from him and he's like crying and, and angry all at the same time. When I was recording him, the first time this ever happened, I actually had tears going down my eye, my face. And I was like, oh, you're my favorite character now. And he was until Koro Sensei. And then Koro Sensei took the top, top spot. Koro Sensei is just fun. I love playing Koro. Plus, he gets, Coral gets to do a lot of different voices, you know? Question here? Yeah, uh, I remember, going back to what the person said about if Krillin were to speak with Usopp, I do remember there was like a crossover episode where Usopp actually did speak with Krillin. Uh, if that, which was, it was like a three-way crossover between uh, One Piece, Dragon Ball Z, and Toriko, and, but it was never dubbed, so I was wondering, if it actually was dubbed, would you be able to handle something like that? What did he say? Uh, it, there was a cross. There's a crossover that wasn't dubbed. Oh, there, right, 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 right. With uh, uh, with fairy tale, right? No, with uh, Torico. Torico. Okay. Would you be able to handle that situation of talking to yourself in that? Scene? I I would totally handle that situation like a professional, <laughs> and uh, tell me tell me when it happens and I'll be there. <laughs> Do you find yourself difficult to work with, or who you? Me? Yeah, are you very difficult to work, difficult to work with. I'm also very difficult to live with. I don't know how my wife put up their, their 21 years now. But yeah, I am very, no, I'm, I'm pretty easy to work with. Because I, I also, I've directed a lot, and so I, I know how to be diplomatic. Makes sense. Question up here. Of uh, all the characters you've played, which one inspires you the most? Uh, well, you know, I have to say it would be Koro Sensei. I started teaching uh, voice acting lessons the same week I got cast as Koro Sensei. And so some of the things that he'd say in, in his class, I found I was saying in my class. I mean, when you're, when you're teaching, teaching process is basically the same. You just have to apply it to uh, different subjects. And so, yeah, he was very uh, inspirational. I hear a lot of noises in my voice. Question over here. So, of all the characters you've had to voice, which one was the most challenging for you? Uh, Usopp is very challenging, as I did in that little scene there. He is Krillin with a hitch in his voice, and that hitch does hurt after about three hours. Um, usually when I record him, I don't record anything the next day. I need a full day to heal. Uh, the next, but the really the most challenging one was present Mike on My Hero Academia. And it was the only part I had to give up I did it for the first season, because the first season you just talk like this, hey everybody, welcome, it's me, Professor Mike, you know? And the second season, he started screaming everything he said, and pitching my voice like that and screaming on top of it was a lot harder than I thought, and it gave me laryngitis, and then the laryngitis turned into pneumonia, and when I got well, I came back to Funimation, and... Um, I said, I don't know, I might have to quit. I may have to stop doing this part. And I was directing at the time, so I asked if I could just direct myself. And they said, yes, whatever it takes. And two lines into it of screaming again, I could feel it coming back. I said, I can't believe this. I do Usopp for hours, but I can't do this character screaming. So I had to give him up. Uh, Dave Trusco's done a fine job with him since then though. Uh, and then they brought me back last year as the villain Redestro, so that was fun too. Say anybody else? Question in the back. Can you guys hear what I'm saying? Understand what I'm saying from there? Because yeah. I, I hear mostly just echo up here. Yeah, it's bad from behind the speaker. But as long as it's, it's clear to you guys, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, were you scared for uh, Krillin when he was 
entering the tournament of power? Or and were you happy about the Destructo disc? Was I scared for Krillin during what? The tournament of power at the end of uh, Super. Tournament of power? Oh, in the tournament of power. Yes. No, but I'm never scared for him. <laughs> I can play scared for him. I thought I, Krillin is actually doing pretty good now. I mean, he defeated a, a dude that defeated Android 18, and Android 18 could mop the floor with Super Saiyan 1. So I think Krillin is definitely in Super Saiyan 1 territory at this point. Yeah. He does all right. I love that though. I, I improvised a line. Um, I can't remember what the original line was, but I said, I am totally Krillin it today. <laughs> and then he gets slapped from behind. Yeah, totally Krillin move. How much room for improv do you have? Um, not a lot. I mean, the script writers are pretty good. Um, but I just thought it would be funny to put there. The, the line they wrote was perfectly fine for the scene. But, you know, Krillin, it's kind of been a meme for a while. So that well, that'd be kind of cool to include that meme in there. And I looked at the flaps, and after you do this for a while, you can tell if something's going to fit in the flaps pretty quickly. And so I said, I've got something else I want to say. And they said, okay, go ahead. And so I said that. And they're usually pretty open. Like sometimes, especially those of us who've been doing this a long time, we're like, uh, I think Krillin would probably say it this way, you know? Because you're always getting new writers and everything. Um, and, and also sometimes, like when I did, I directed Lupin the Third. I did we like, like nine movies. And I told my actors, look, the script is good, but if you think of a way to say this in the same way and be funnier or more poignant, go for it. So there was a lot of improvising in my movies. Makes sense. How much ownership do you feel like you have over these characters? Because I know it's a collaborative process, so. Um, yeah, I mean, quite a lot. And, you know, when you're the voice actor, uh, you get the credit or the blame generally, you know. They don't really look at the director who might have said, yeah, say it this way and it wasn't very good or whatever. So you really need to take ownership of it, you know. Um, I always tell my students, because a lot of times you're just sort of thrown into a scene. Um, there was a, a acting coach back in the 50s named Boleslavsky, and he wrote a book called Acting the First Six Lessons. And he said, if you're just thrown in the middle of a scene without any context before or after, like in a movie or voice acting, he said, give yourself an action verb for your motivation. So um, put a microphone on anybody over there. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi, hang on. Before you talk, I want you to say, I'm going to the store. Uh, I'm going to the store. Now, I want you to say that, and I want you to kill me with those words. What? Kill me with the words, I'm going to the store. Like, say it in an edgy way, or? <laughs> All right. I'm going to the store. There you go. That's good. Now, love me. Okay, um. With I'm going to the store. What? <laughs> it's a very difficult concept. Anyway, it works for me. Uh, not for everybody, obviously. What's your question? Uh, yes, we've actually met a couple of times, like, um, Hattori Khan 20. Do I still owe you 20? No, oh, no. Okay. no. Anyway, I heard from a little birdie that you do a really good Donald Duck impression. Can we hear it? Can't do it with a cough drop. Oh, it's okay, I understand. <laughs> Oh, really? I think it's cringe. That's good to hear. Now, here's the thing. Donald Duck is not a voice. It's a whistle. Because you can talk and do it at the same time. See? So it sounds like a possessed duck. Good, because he's going to be one of my future cosplays that I'm trying to put on the voice. It's been a long time since I've done Donald Duck. It was the first voice I did. My dad used to do impressions of cartoon characters all the time, and he could do Donald Duck. And so I watched him. I was four years old. I was just watching him do it all day, and he was at work, and I was going, just trying to get it down, you know? And he usually would come home and he'd go, so he said, 
Yeah, I have an uncle that would always do that. He's always been my favorite. Uh, I'll make sure I cosplay him to a, a convention that you're going to and I'm going to. As long as you know how to shake those tail feathers. So Donald Duck is like a kind of a difficult voice. It's a whistle. A difficult whistle to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said you teach. So a lot of new voice actors injure themselves pretty early. Yeah. Um, what kind of things do you advise to keep yourself healthy while voice acting? Well, that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. Never had that question before, but it's a good question. Um, there is a thing called screaming over the pencil. It's a technique. Uh, everyone, put your finger between your teeth like this. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is try to scream underneath the finger. Ah! Oh, okay. okay. That's the wrong way. Stop. Stop. You hurt yourself. But now I want you to try to scream over the finger. Ah! Oh! Oh! Did you feel it open up more in your throat? That is the way to cause the least damage. They call it screaming over the pencil. Like when I'm doing Usopp, I'm always thinking over the pencil, over the pencil. Uh, so that it causes the least amount of damage. And I'm still talking after 24 years. Uh, I probably have maybe five years left before it completely wears out. But uh, that really has helped me sustain. So it is a good way to, if you're screaming, if you get into the business doing video games, you're gonna do a lot of screaming. So just think over the pencil, over the pencil. Question over here? Also warm up. And you can warm, a very simple warm up is just to hum lightly the highest note you can hit. And then go down to the lowest. And just do that like about for five minutes before you go and record and that'll keep you warmed up. You got a question here? Any thoughts on Team Four Stars, Dragon Ball Z, and Rich and how they took characters you've played for years and made extreme, ridiculous versions of them? Okay, here's what I heard. Uh, what is your thoughts? It's like talking to Charlie Brown's teacher. <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, the anime abridged and the Team Four Stars uh, approach to your character? What is that? Really? I'm just kidding. I know it. <laughs> I think that uh, the Krillin own count is absolute genius, <laughs> and I loved it though. When he finally, when uh, Android 18 kisses him and the own town goes, goes down, that was cool. Yeah, I, I like those guys. I actually uh, had them over at my house uh, once. We were, we were trying to come up with a, an original concept for an animation, but we all got too busy to do anything about it. But yeah, they're good guys. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, there's Just one right up toward the front. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, I'm truly sorry for the passing of Billy Kometz. I'm not sure if you knew him personally, but um, my main reason for coming here is because I recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in theater, and I always wanted to be in voice acting or video game acting. Yeah. And I honestly have, like, no idea where to audition, where to go, and it's like every voice actor I've ever spoken to they're, they always just say the same thing. You gotta find your own way in. I'm like, well, can you like give me an idea of where to go, what to do, like what equipment I should buy? It's like, I have anxiety disorders, so when I hear those things, it makes me feel like it's hopeless. And well, you're Sonny Straight. You're the voice of Lupin and a variety of other characters. I've seen almost every single one of your anime. Yeah. I have them all on Blu-ray too, but I was hoping that maybe if you'd be willing to Give me your wisdom. I would be now. What efficient. kind of experience do you have? Uh, I have been in multiple plays. I actually did the voices of the Nazis and and Frank, which was a very awkward but fun experience. Uh, I do voices on almost every single day. I do them in the mirror. I do them when I'm alone. I like to just play around with things. Yeah, and. Like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like an antisocial person, but when I use my voices, I just feel alive. Like, I can do this in an open place, no problem, because it's like you're a different person. It's not like you're that, what, like, my name is Reed Denny. It's like, I, I'm not Reed Denny anymore. I'm this person. Yeah. You know, uh, when the pan, I used to teach classes in person in my own studio, and the pandemic hit, and I had to switch to doing it online. But it's weird. I think that people learn faster online 
because they're less intimidated. And also, it's weird, like right now about 50% of my students are getting work. And I think the reason why is because the industry really needs people who are trained to do this. Like Crunchyroll is getting at least 20 new shows every three months. That's a lot of content that they need actors for. And what I'm finding is that a lot of people who are trained by me online are getting work when they probably would not have in the normal setting because they're too shy to go in person and audition and things like that, right? So a lot of shy people now who had the talent all along are starting to shine because of the pandemic. So if there's any good thing to come out of it, that's one of them. Um, but yeah, I would recommend you taking my class. Chris Rager has a class. There's tons of people. We have like a floating university of voice actors who teach online, and that's a really good place to start. Okay. How would one find your classes? Oh, uh, my classes go to sunnystraightstudios.com. I think I've got one in July. I might have to move that to August, but we'll see. You always get this plugged in. Yeah. And if you take that class, what I also do is anyone takes the basic class, I have a, an advanced class that I offer for them as well. Uh, so speaking of the pandemic, I know you had to do a lot of your uh, recordings at home. Yeah. Can you have any recommendations on equipment? Uh, no. Um, okay. Because it's always changing. Uh, the, the equipment that I've got, the Funimation just gave me, um, was an Apogee Pro uh mic system but and it's it's a good system um but not every studio takes that and so you might if you're trying to record from home you might have to go a little bit more high end uh these days and i'm not sure what the high end is uh mine works fine and and, and they they get really good recordings they say it's just as good as at funimation but you also need to have a good recording space you know you need to have um some uh, sound dampening equipment on your walls, you know, and some bass traps and stuff like this. You can research all this online, how to build your own recording booth on YouTube, and they'll give you step-by-step -step instructions of how to do this on, on the cheap. It really doesn't cost that much if you do it yourself. Very good, anyone else? All right, I have a question from Twitter. Oh, go for it. Uh, how was it uh, going from Krillin, a more lighthearted character, to Bardock, a more serious character? That was weird. Um, I had done some some villains, and um, so the director wanted me to do. He, he just, I didn't even audition for Bardock, but he wanted me to push my voice like really low for Bardock, right? And I said, okay, then I have to do this in the morning because that's my voice gets higher as the day goes on. So he said, okay. So it was all recorded in the morning, but I was I was why do we, why do his voice have to be low? In Japan, it's voiced by a woman. And here, I'm playing Goku's dad, and Sean Schimmel doesn't have a deep voice, you know? It just seemed like a weird choice, but it kind of works for him, though. He's kind of, a, kind of a badass, you know? And that lower voice works for him well. It was also kind of cool to play something that's more serious, you know? Although, a lot of people will say, does it bother you that Bardock is the badass and he gets so little lines? Whereas Krillin gets all the lines and he's a goofball. And I'm like, no, I love playing Krillin. I mean, yes, it's fun being the badass, right? But it is so much more fun getting your ass kicked. You know, that's so much more fun to do. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting transition, but I, I play a lot of different weird kind of characters, you know, that run the gambit. From a sweet, lovable dad to a goofball squid thing. So yeah. I see one in the back row. Yeah, let me go to the back here. Oh, I want to say something before you ask a question about getting into the anime business. Don't feel that you have to be able to do a lot of voices. Uh, I know it sounds weird coming from me, but the thing is, most of the animes, if you notice, take place in high schools, uh, and it's very straight. And just uh, we tend to typecast in that way. Um, so if you just have a ni nice natural speaking voice, you don't have to do funny voices. Like like some of my favorite actors at Funimation, like Micah Solisad, he always sounds like Micah, you know? But it, it works for a lot of roles. He's one of the busiest actors we have. All right, sorry, what was your question? 
Hi, so you've worked with uh, some similar, the same people, but on different shows, and like Christopher Sabat, for example, you've worked with on One Piece and Dragon Ball. So does it ever like throw you off when you work with the same people, or is it like a fun surprise when you find out that you are? No, it's always fun. And uh, the great thing about One Piece and it is a lot of the same Dragon Ball Z actors, and that was just out of chance, really, because this one was a, a weird audition. Oda wanted, um, it was done by Four Kids first, right? You guys probably don't remember this company called Four Kids. I do. They, they did the first uh, iteration of One Piece in this country, but it didn't go too well. I think they were trying to make it too kid-friendly, you know, which is kind of impossible for some of the animes, you know, like Sanji had a lollipop instead of a cigarette and things like that. And that weird look of change where they replaced the gun with the weird bounce Yeah, you're old enough to remember all the weird things that they did. Yeah. And then they, um, so Oda said, well, we want to cast him here. So it was the, so what they did was Funimation held auditions. They got the top seven to 10 actors for each part that they liked. They sent the recordings to Japan and Oda and his crew decided who's going to be what. So it was the first time I was ever cast by the creator of the series. So it was just, it was just by luck that the Dragon Ball Z actors all seemed to make it into it, you know? But um, also it's the only part I say that if you don't like the way I do it, I don't care because the creator of the series says that's what he hears in his head. I can't do any better than that, you know? But uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I, believe me, because there's a lot of dub haters out there, I love throwing that one in their face. <laughs> Question over here. So, Oda recently mentioned that he, One Piece is entering the final stage of the series. So, uh, how are you going to feel when the series does finally end, considering it's already been over a thousand episodes? It's been quite a commitment, I imagine. Yeah, uh, I definitely will save money on cough drops. Um, I, I'm gonna miss it. I love play, playing that character. He's been with me for a long time. But uh, let's see, where are we now? Okay. What? Okay. If you're talking about the manga, we're currently at the end of the Wano arc, but as far as the dub's concerned, as far as I can tell, it's still on Whole Cake Island. Okay, and how far is the anime in Japan? How far are they recorded? Uh, if, I had, if I remember correctly, they're at close to 1,100 episodes, and there's also the new movie coming out, One Piece Red, which is supposed to be coming out in October this year. So they're around 1,100, and how many does he predict they'll be? Uh, he didn't say. He said it's entering the final arc, but that final the, the, threat, final That could be another quarter yeah, of it, yes. Yeah, some people think it'll probably be another five, six arcs. It might be, depends, because it, it could be like Alabasta, or it could be... And we're so far behind, it could be another 10 years before we finish with this thing. Maybe it's not finishing soon enough. <laughs> no. Uh, I, yeah, I bet it will go at least another five years in this country, probably more. Any other questions? We're coming back to you. Run, run. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you had to drop out with uh, President Mike. Um, outside of that character, has there ever been a character for any reason that you uh, despised in retrospect, voice acting? <laughs> Here's the trick to acting. If you're playing God or Satan, you must have empathy for your character. Otherwise, it will not be believable. So you have to find some way to, at the very least, understand the character. Um, because empathy is such, is, is the main talent that you, an actor has, is being able to put themselves in that character's place. And sometimes you, you play some icky characters and you feel like you have to have a, an exorcism or something to get them out of your system, but you must commit to it, otherwise it'll fall flat. Um, but there was one character, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you what show it was on, but, um, he was uh, this Weasley guy buying soiled panties from a soiled panty store. Very sad and depressing. And I'm like, what What do you do with soiled panties? Make soup, I guess. But anyway, I was, 
I was pretty disgusted by it, but the most disgusting thing for me about it was I didn't really care. I was like, really? You have no soul? You just played this disgusting character, and you're like, next? <laughs> so, no, not really. Or were there any that you despised because of what it did to your voice? No, no, because if I'm doing it with my voice, then it's because I feel the character needs that. And I, I, I don't mind destroying my voice for it. Thanks, guys. I, I look at it like, um, like a professional athlete. You know, they're gonna be broken by the end. Their body's gonna be used up. So if I haven't used up my voice at the end, I don't think I gave enough, you know? Makes sense. Yes, you had a question. Hi, sorry if you don't mind me asking again, but have you ever met like any of the manga artists who create your characters or the Japanese counterparts of the characters you play? No, in 24 years, I have been at conventions that they were in the year before. And I'm like, you guys couldn't have made that work in the same year? But no, it's never happened. I wish it had. Question over here. Uh, what was your weirdest character? Weirdest character? Not Krillin. <laughs> He's not that weird. I mean, he doesn't have a nose, which is odd. <laughs> um, there was a character, I don't even remember what show it was, but I played this lion looking thing that had three legs, and he was so weird. Um, and also I played a character um, that had like, it was like a little angel guy, but he had, it was a cat face, but it was a like a 40 year old man's face on a cat body, just twisted. Um, but that's why I like anime, I like twisted characters like that, so it's kind of hard for me to judge what's weird. It's I'm amazing kind of how little that narrowed it down. What's that? It's amazing how little that narrowed it down on what show it could be. It could be uh, several shows. Cat person. Question here. Besides One Piece, is there any other anime that you could be working on? Okay. Uh, besides One Piece, is there anything you're currently working on? Ah. Uh, let, just finished the Dragon Ball Z movie, and that should be out, I think, in a couple of months, right? Soon. Uh, oh. I, I'm not going to tell you anything, except I will say this. Krillin does some cool stuff in it, yes. and it's very old school. It's old school Dragon Ball Z, the whole movie is. You'll go, oh, yeah, this feels like, like uh, yeah, that's all I, I can't say anymore, but it's good. Uh, and again, I, I just mentioned I have a comic book uh, that just came out from Dark Horse, um, and I'm working on another series as well. Uh, and it's just and teaching. You know, and some small anime parts here and there. Got another question over here? Actually, I was going to ask too, if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, first, can you still do Apachai's laugh from Kenichi, the Mightiest Disciple? You know, the whole <laughs> Can I do Apachai? Yeah, I think so. Um, that was one that I did, I took a risk in the audition. Um, I watched some clips of it uh, on YouTube, and the original Japanese, the character is supposed to be from another country, right? So since we're doing it in English, he's going to be speaking in broken English. Um, but it was just, we just nondescript, you know. Um, but he has this, in the Japanese, everything he says is up here! I want to do this, blah, 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 right? And I thought, wouldn't it be funnier though, because he's a big guy, if he like talk like this, and then it would slip into the appa, like almost like a nervous tick, like Muay Thai is the art of barehanded man killing. Appa, appa. You know, and he would just went into it like that. I, I did that in the audition, and I, it worked. So I got cast in it for that weird delivery. Generally, we try to sound like the Japanese. Like we, they try to find, we try to find actors that are suited for it because the actors that they choose are going to look perfect for the body types that they have, right? So we're trying to find voices that are similar. But I looked at his body type and I thought, this would probably work. I'm gonna give it a shot. And took a risk and it, it paid off. Yeah. Uh, are there any anime coming up in the future that you're hope that you'd like to voice in a character in? Um, not that I've seen. I mean, I, I don't know what's coming up right now. I, and I have been ignoring auditions for a while because I had to do some uh, Usopp and some One Piece stuff and I just didn't have the voice but now there's I'm in a break period 
So I might start looking again because I, I get I get uh, requests to audition like every week. So probably soon. Question over here: uh, If you had to create your own character, uh, how would their personality be? Well, I have made up my own characters. Um, if you go to weshadows.com, W-E shadows.com, you'll see about 300 pages that I drew of a graphic novel originally for Tokyo Pop. Um, do you guys ever heard of A Midsummer Night's Dream? It's a play by Shakespeare. Well, this story is like what those characters are doing today. What Oberon and Titania and Puck and Bottom and what's going on in the world of fairy. And there's a, a soliloquy that Puck says at the end. He says, if we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And I thought, we shadows, that is a badass name for fairies. So that was the name of the title of the book, We Shadows. And Tokyo Pop published two graphic novels. And then on the sec before the second one got to print, they, f they went under and they went out of business. And luckily I had a clause in my contract because I kind of got burned before in comic book companies. It said, if it doesn't get to print by three months after they approve the art, then I get the rights back. I never thought I would need it with Tokyo Pop, but luckily it was there. And uh, Stu Levy is the president of Tokyo Pop. I called him up and I said, hey Stu, I mean, I don't, I know some people are mad because it's falling apart, but I understand it's just business. But if you check the contract 17C clause, you'll see that I'll be getting the rights back in a couple of months. And he goes, oh yeah, you're right. Okay, well, best of luck, man. So then I just put it online as a web comic. So you can read like all of it for free online. And for like a year and a half, it was uh, in the top 10 web comics online. So, so there's a lot of voices on there. I, I know some of the cast in it are actually based on characters, based on actually actors that I know, like their personality I put into the characters. So I know two in particular, I would just cast the voice actors to play those parts. It has just magically appeared behind you, just so you know. What's that? It has just magically appeared behind you. Whoa. <laughs> That's after I, I take a, I stopped drawing the book, and then during the pandemic, I got bored, and so I drew this. A any other questions? Did you guys read it from there? Yeah. Okay. Question up front here. Oh, thank you for the Zoom tech team. Oh, wow. Wait, 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 I gotta take a picture. <laughs> I question up front here. Technical people are on it. Okay, I actually didn't know you were in comics before, but now I'm curious. Uh, that character there, by the way, is is Goat. Way before Goat was a phrase, uh, greatest of all time. Uh, but Goat is the new Puck. She just became Puck in the story. But so and Puck is off. Uh, fighting as a mercenary for Krishna, but it's a long story. <laughs> Sounds great. We have a question up front. Probably readable, but <laughs> I'm curious, what do you, what would you say are your favorite creators or inspirations in comics? Uh, no, could you repeat that? Uh, what are your greatest inspirations in terms of comics? Who inspired you? In oh, that world? oh, okay. Uh, well, Wendy Peeney is the creator of ElfQuest, and um, I met her at Comic-Con back in 1999, I think, and she created the series ElfQuest, and I had read that when I was in high school, and I loved it, and I was doing my first signing as a voice actor at Comic-Con in California, and we were right next to Wendy and her husband Richard, and... Turns out she was a fan of Dragon Ball Z, and I was a huge fan of hers. And she started drawing pictures of our characters with her characters. So I drew her main character, Cutter, with our characters and gave it back to her. And she hired me on the spot to draw ElfQuest. Um, so she's been a big influence on me. And I kind of felt at that point that my art had hit a ceiling 
And so I called her up after she, she wanted to hire me and I said, hey, listen, um, I wanna change the terms of our arrangement. She goes, you want more money? And I went, no, no, I want to be your apprentice. I wanna study under you. I think you're one of the few masters we have left in this craft and I wanna learn from you. And she said, okay, move to Los Angeles. You'll work in my studio and, and draw the next book there and I'll be critiquing everything you do. And I went, that sounds awesome. So I moved to uh, Los Angeles and every day I would draw a page and she'd say, this works, this doesn't. And she'd tell me why. And it was the greatest learning experience of my life. I mean, it was better than anything I got to school or learned on my own. Um, but there are other cartoonists that are a big influence on me. Like I love Will Eisner. Uh, Will Eisner, if you guys don't know, if, for American cartoonists, one of the biggest awards you can get is an Eisner Award and it's named after him. He created a book called The Spirit, which was turned into a really bad movie a few years ago. But uh, it was a comic book that was seven pages and it was in newspapers. So everybody who got a newspaper in the country knew about this weird little comic book in the 40s and 50s called The Spirit. And then it turned out years later, he found out he had a lot of fans and they kept putting him and putting on again. And then he, he's the one that termed the phrase graphic novel. He created a book he thought was really long and he said, well, what am I gonna call this, long comic book? No, I'll just call it a graphic novel. Um, and I met him when I was just starting out as a cartoonist. Do you guys ever heard of Hellboy? That was created by a guy named Mike Mignola. And he, Mike Mignola was at the same convention as Will Eisner. And I brought my portfolio, I'm just starting out. I, I, I'm so scared. And he, I said, would you mind looking at my artwork to Mike Mignola? Now this is way before Hellboy. The only thing he was known for then was drawing Rocket Raccoon. I didn't know this, right? But Rocket Raccoon was, of course, very cartoony and stuff, right? He looked at my work and he was making a joke that I didn't get. And he said, oh, I don't know anything about this cartoony crap. Meaning that's all he does, right? I took it as he thinks my work is crap and I was defeated and I quit comics forever on the spot. And I was walking away dejected. And then my buddy Billy said, hey, there's Will Eisner. Because Will Eisner's my hero. And I said, yeah, whatever. And he goes, because I'm done. I'm not doing comics anymore. I quit. And he goes, show him your work. And I said, I'm never showing my work to another human being as long as I live. And Billy got behind me and shoved me into Will Eisner, an old man. I could have killed him. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. My friend's an idiot, man. I, 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 sorry, Mr. Eisner, I'm a big fan though. And he looked down, he goes, is that your portfolio? And I went, uh, yeah. <laughs> he goes, can I see it? And I went, oh my God, this is it. I'm just gonna shoot myself when I get home. So he set it on a nearby table and he looked at it and he goes, oh, this is really good storytelling. I like that. I like what you did there. So it seemed like you're going for more cartoony style. You might wanna check out a book by Preston Blair on cartooning and animation. And uh, he said, but listen, I teach cartooning in New York. If you were one of my students, you'd be like one of the best ones. And I was like, okay, I'm never gonna stop drawing comics. <laughs> this all happened within 15 minutes. I quit comics, was ready to kill myself, and no one will ever tell me not to draw comics again. It was, it was an amazing experience. Conventions are a great way to, if you're trying to start a career in comics or anime or whatever, go to conventions, talk to the professionals, because they will steer you in the right direction. Panels are great. I learned so much about comics and, and panels going to these just like this. Is that it your question? Yeah. Okay, I forgot what your question was. I just went on that rant. It was quite a roller coaster. I think we yeah. all learned something. Uh, question up front. As watching anime or being a comic book collector, it's always disappointing when you get invested in a series and it just stops for whatever reason. Uh -huh. Sometimes in the middle of an arc. Yeah. Has there ever been an anime you worked on or particularly liked or a comic book you've worked on or particularly liked that this has happened to you? Yeah, where it just sort of stops at the end. That We Shadows did. <laughs> I got a job doing an elf quest for Dark Horse and I had to quit. Um, and, and at the time though, it was, it was a blessing for me because I had done two graphic novels, pretty much said what I wanted to say and I was just making it up as I went along. And I made it up for about 100 pages of just going along. But my favorite cousin 
It was my age, we were like twins. We grew up in the crib together and he died in an automobile accident. And I couldn't draw because when you draw, you really got to get in touch with your subconscious and your soul. And that was too painful, I couldn't face it. So I just stopped, you know? And Wendy said, I need a colorist for the final quest for Elf Quest. And I told them that I want you to do it at Dark Horse. And I went, oh good, because that, that's a lot easier. Coloring is, while it does take an artistic eye, at the same time, it's still a lot more technical involved than trying to bear my soul on paper. So um, that, that actually, so I stopped that and I've directed shows that they didn't really have an ending for. They try to wrap it up like, you could tell when they didn't have, like, like some of them I think they were planning to do two seasons too and just didn't get the funding or it was canceled. So they just wrap it up in one, uh, one episode at the end. You've probably seen a lot like that, right? And when we were getting 20, uh, 20 shows a quarter, uh, you would get one of those a year, you know, that was just like really good shows, but for whatever reason, they just didn't go on to another season. Uh, that answer your question? Uh, Servamp was one, um, Eld Live was another. That's the only two I come to mind right now. I think this might have been the only two I directed. Kadocha? What? Kadocha? What was that one I could do? Child's Toy? What? You were Zinjiro? Zinjiro? Oh, yeah, yeah, Kodacha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a good series, too. Yeah, I was just in that one. I didn't actually direct that one, but yeah. I, well, no, that's not true. I did direct some of it. Yeah. Uh, Laura Bailey was the main director on that. But she was also busy doing other things, and so she needed a pitch hitter every now and then. So I'd come in and do, uh, I'd probably direct to maybe 10 of them. Laura sure. really is so funny, though. She, she, uh, I would just crack up listening to her reads on that, and it would make me want to be funnier. So that, you know, because it felt like she was throwing the gauntlet down on humor. Question over here. Okay. You! That's what I was up? trying to do with the Goku voice server. You trying to do that, the, uh, you try to do Goku? Is that what? Yeah, like the high pitch. Yo, yo, Krillin. The only, the only Goku I can do is that sound when he's powering up. You're not gonna do that. You're not gonna power up. Where's your commitment? <laughs> Kaioken! Man, that was really good. Except you dropped the energy at the end. Kaioken! All right, one more time. Hold it all the way through as if you're going to say something else right after this. Just as powerful. Kyle can't understand! Nice. Very nice. Oh, actual question. My question is, could you do the Sensu Bean thing from uh, the Abridge for me real quick? What does he say? Yo, Sensu Bean. He says that in the other series, too. <laughs> Sensu Bean. Oh, yeah, we say it like uh, his version? Yeah. Sensu Bean. So on the subject of other characters, do you ever get to record in the same room as other voice actors? How does that affect the process? Rarely, rarely. Um, when I was doing Lupin the Third, I had a little bit more leeway because we had like uh, a few weeks to do the, the movies. Um, so sometimes I would get characters in the same booth just to get their vocal chemistry together, you know, but then I would make them re-recorded uh, separately just so they have clean reads. You don't want too many people breathing in the booth at the same time, unless it's a crowd scene, you know. Question way back here in the back. So, uh, out of all the characters you voiced, if any, was there a character that you're like, "Wow, that's me"? Like, you related to a lot, or no? Yeah, Koro Sensei feels like me. Yeah, mostly. So they're good. M minus the destroying the planet. What? Minus the destroying the planet. No, that's me. <laughs> Makes sense. Question up front here. So you said you had to quit present blank because it hurt you. Has there been any other characters that uh, you had to quit for any reason? Any other characters I what? Had to quit for any reason. No. That's the one? No. I don't think so. I mean, maybe. Because I did some characters when I lived in LA. I don't know if they continued them when I moved, but I think we'd finish those series, so probably not. Question over here. Okay. 
So you said you had to like emphasize with your uh, characters. So besides Koro Sensei, because you were going through teaching at that time, is there anyone that you really empathized with that was like really, really, I guess like Heath Ledger Joker kind of? All I heard is a guitar solo. Has there ever been a character you kind of like lost yourself in, like Heath Ledger with the joke? Has there ever been a character? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that Usopp, like I said, he actually made me cry. You know, I really got caught in him. And I, a lot of shows I did on stage when I did theater, because I did theater for 14 years before Funimation moved to Texas. And I remember one show is called uh, Hot and Throbbing, very cutting edge play about a, a, a woman who writes romance novels, whose ex-husband is a piece of crap and he ends up killing her in the end of the play, strangling her to death. Um, I played that character, and of course, I gave it my all, and I felt ugh, horrible afterwards. Like, I, just could, I felt like I needed an exorcism of some kind, so I bleached my hair blonde, just so I didn't have to look at myself in the mirror, because it looked too much like me. And then, uh, that's, that was enough to break the spell. But yeah, sometimes you can. You can get really lost into a character, and especially if they're not like you, and you commit to this personality that's not you at all, it can be kind of haunting. And I really researched, I went to like bars, and I like would find these guys I just thought were just probably complete vicious assholes, and I just started walking behind them, getting their walk down, getting their voices down, you know? Um, yeah, you can though. That has happened a long time though, that I felt like, I needed an exorcism to get it out of my system. A question over here. Yeah. Were there any parts you really wanted but didn't get? Yeah, I wanted anything on Sergeant Frog. And I auditioned for it. I didn't get anything on that one. But generally, if I really wanted a part, I was lucky enough to get it, you know? Um, that, but that was one show I was not. And I was like, ah, I would be perfect for Sergeant Frog. But end up playing the character anyway later. Question here in the middle. It's totally nice to meet you. My question for you is, what was your favorite season uh, playing as Krillin in Dragon Ball Z? My favorite season of Krillin? You know, I really like doing Dragon Ball Z Kai. And if for people who say they, they, <coughs> they like the original better, that's just because you probably saw the edited version that we did on TV because the unedited version is so much better. I mean, it's, and Chris Sabat let several of us who have already directed at Funimation direct our own characters. So I got to direct Krillin for a, quite a while on Kai, and that was my favorite because I got to deliver him exactly the way I wanted him to, to, to be spoken. Yeah. Question here? Hi, yeah. Just wanted, this is a bit of a, sorry, I'll just say. Was Reed Destro typecast? Reed Destro? Yeah, was he, was he typecast because of, the, because of the nose that made you think of Usopp? Oh, I was like, I don't have a nose like that. <laughs> <laughs> I do play characters, though, that have unusual facial fi features, usually around the nose. Yeah. Krillin doesn't have a nose. Usopp's got a long nose. Reed Destro's got a big fat one. And he looks like, uh, for. Dr. Doofus, what's his name? Doofus yeah. Works? Yeah, that's him. Uh, hanging around with the platypus dude. Um, nah, nah, I wasn't typecast. I just, I just auditioned and they liked what I did. Question here in the middle. Uh, do you think you can do Curlin's Destructo Disc? Not loudly. Destructo Disc! We've got just a little over five minutes left, so I think we have time for one or two more questions. One or two more questions. I, I think I've got you, so I'll come over here. You had said earlier that you didn't audition for Bardock, so how did that casting come about? Um, John Bergmeier directed that one, and he had heard me do a villain that was just had a few lines, or, or bad guy that just had a few lines in some episode. And he thought that that voice would be great for Bardock. So that's how it was cast. And a lot of times that's the way it's done. You know, it's like they heard you on something else and went, oh, that would be good for this, you know? 
Uh, also, if you get in at Funimation or Crunchyroll, I gotta remember to say that now. Um, but you can, it's easier to get cast if you're working, you know, because directors are always casting in their brains because they always have a new show and every episode usually introduces new characters. And so they're trying to figure out who it will work and they can't have auditions all the time. We can't have auditions every week. So a lot of times you're walking in the hallway, you're like, oh, Chris Sabat, he'd be perfect as this or whatever, <laughs> you know? So that's, uh, that's a lot of times. And a lot of times it's just like, like uh, there was a, a show we did, um, Rage of the Bahamut, that's really good. If you guys check it out, Rage of the Bahamut is awesome. It is one of the best animated animes I've ever seen. And it's not open, closed mouth like this. It's actually full animation of the mouth, full animation of the movements. And it's a really good story. Um, but the main character is very Lupin the Third like, right? Um, and I had auditions for it, and nobody got the voice down to match this character. And I turned to, and I don't like casting myself, right? But I was at this point, I was like, I think I got to cast myself. And I went to Justin Cook. And I told him, I said, I, I think I'm gonna have to cast myself. Nobody is, is nailing this. And this is the main character, right? And he said, well, have you, did you have Ian Sinclair to audition? I went, no, and I wasn't really familiar with Ian's work at that point. Uh, this was before Brooke, I think. And no, it might've been the same time, but, I, but Brooke was not the right voice for this, right? And he said, uh, have you heard of a Space Dandy? And I went, no. And we went on YouTube together. We heard, I pulled up Space Dandy. Two lines into it, I went, is he available? Because that's perfect, you know? That's exactly what I was looking for. And it was actually even more of what the character needed to be than my Lupin approach. So it, it worked out great. So casting happens in many different ways. I think this is gonna have to be our last question. And final question, here we go. So you can talk about anything you love, but can you um, talk about it as if you're General Maze from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood? Well, uh, let's see, Roy. How you doing? Uh, it's good talking to you, man. Now listen, I was thinking about you the other day. I was, I was out on the beach with my daughter, Alicia, and she was wearing a bikini. I know she's a little young for a bikini, but oh my God, she was so adorable. And I took so many pictures. Now listen, man, if you got married, you could have a wife, you could have kids, and if you had kids, you could take pictures of your kids, and then we could treat them like trading cards. Get yourself a wife. How's that? It's a good note to end on. You guys, please come see me at my table. I'll be there all weekend, all right? Do you do any other panels or anything that you're doing during the uh, convention? Do you have any other panels or anything I you're doing? I think it's the only one for this convention. So thanks for coming to it. All right. Woo! Have a great day, everyone. Sunny Street. Thank you for coming. Sunny, everybody. Thank you, guys.